Okay. Um, <laughs> but welcome. Um, I wanted to introduce Susan Skull. A little background on, on herself um, before we get started. But um, this all came about when the women's group uh, just finished reading Rembrandt in the Wind. And uh, I think it kind of was a little eye opening for some of us to sit back and while learning the history of some of the, you know, famous artists, uh, kind of looking at painting and art with a different uh, viewpoint and how we see God and different faith aspects in, in artwork. And so I will let you uh, begin, but I thought we could open with a short prayer. God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for those blessed to be artists who steward your gifts through divine beauty. Bless all who create in your image. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Very um, good. Yes, I was. I watched some of the coronation yesterday, um, and it struck me that it seems that they made the point several times, hi, come on in, we're just starting, um, that um, England is a secular nation in this secular age. This is a very religious service in a secular time. And it just seemed like they were making this point over and over again. And um, it, it struck me um, as I was thinking about these paintings because these artists definitely had uh, a sacred idea behind their work. Uh, my name is Susan Scola and I am a teacher currently at Christ Episcopal School in Rockville, Maryland. Um, for many years, I was um, uh, a docent, school docent at the National Gallery of Art and gave tours to children pre-K through high school um, and really enjoyed spending time in the gallery and being especially go getting to go in early and be alone with the pictures, which was a real, real gift. Um, I taught at the fourth Presbyterian school, which was your neighbor back in the day um, and began by teaching art. But uh, today I teach English and social studies and civics. Um, at Christ Episcopal, and some of you I know know um, Cindy Mammalian, and I ha have the pleasure of teaching all three of her children. <laughs> um, so I told uh, Marianne when she approached me that that today's talk would have to do with faith in the everyday or sacred images in secular uh, or sacred messages in secular images. Um, so I, I really enjoy Dutch paintings, and so I selected four paintings that I'd like to talk about today. Now, uh, Netherlands, you know, is a very small country in Europe, and uh, after the Reformation, especially after uh, the Dutch were able to gain their freedom from Spain, there was a tremendous rise in Protestantism in that country. And the Dutch Reformed Church became the main church, and it based its teachings on the ideas of John Calvin and the teachings of John Calvin. So it was a very reformed church, which means that the pulpit became central in the sanctuary because preaching was the most important thing. So artists were no longer being commissioned to create any kind of art for churches. There were not going to be any more paintings, stained glass windows, um, altar pieces, uh, that's all going to go by the wayside. So what are artists going to do? And Dutch painters begin painting smaller paintings that can go in people's homes. And they start painting things that are not necessarily um, biblical images. Um, Rembrandt is the exception to that, but uh, he did paint biblical images. But many of the artists started to look for things other than um, and hoped that people would buy their art to put in their homes, so the paintings are much smaller. Um, they were blessed at this moment in time, not unlike Italy during the Renaissance, when you have this just amazing large number of people who are gifted and talented who are creating all at the same time. So a golden age of art begins to happen in Netherlands. Um, and they begin to look for things of that are familiar to people, that are everyday, that are subjects that people would recognize and maybe want to have in their home. 
So they're going to do genre scenes uh, and landscapes and seascapes because the sea is very important to the Dutch. And it's going to make them very wealthy because trade is going to become very important. And still life paintings. So that brings us to our first picture, which is by William Class Hedda. This is the earliest picture I'm going to show you, uh, painted in 1635. And it's called Banquet Piece with Mince Pie. <laughs> and the first thing that just always wows me when I see any of these pictures is the skill of these artists, their ability to be able to represent <laughs> what we see so realistically. It's just really amazing. And all of them, and this is a really good example, are able to do texture in such an amazing way. And all of the textures are realistic and believable. Space is totally believable in this picture. You know, you want to push the things back because it looks like they're going to fall off the table. Um, and this is really an amazing thing. So imagine you would buy this picture, maybe to hang in your dining room. So let's look a little more closely. First of all, I'm always just amazed by this piece of cloth. Uh, you know, he even has, when you look up close, and all of these paintings are in the National Gallery of Art, and the National Gallery of Art has a great website where you can find the image, and then you can zoom in, and you can actually see some things more closely than you would be able to see um, even looking at the real painting. So if, if you like any of these images and you want to see them more closely afterwards, go to the website. So, you know, you can see the folds, you can see the lights and the darks, and I think that maybe he was proud of this part too, because if you look very, very carefully, right down here is where the artist has signed his name and put the, the year, the date. So um, this looks like it's after the meal. Everything's a little scrunched up. And then if we look more closely, we can see, well, there's the remains of the mince pie that we have for dinner. And there are olives, one has fallen onto the table. There's this beautiful lemon with the peel that's been carefully uh, taken off, but also is hanging over the table edge. And we can tell the texture of the peel is different than the texture of the lemon. And if you look closely, you can see some lemon slices are on the plate with the pie. So that's where the other rest of the lemon is gone. And there are oyster shells. There's oyster shells behind the lemon and over on the other side on the plate. So this has been a very rich meal. Um, Obviously, you don't grow lemons and olives in Netherlands. So these are coming from Mediterranean climates, which is just another example of the trade that the Dutch were doing. They have things that are coming from all around the world. And obviously, this is somebody of wealth who has had this dinner. And it was a very wealthy country. So if we want to look a little bit more closely and dive in a little bit more, we notice that, hmm, some things are kind of upset on the table too. Besides the cloth being all bunched up, that compote or whatever it is has fallen over. And if you look very closely, this beautiful pewter pitcher has been dinged up. It has dents in it. Um, so it's not perfect. And that's a glass that has fallen down. And then over on the other side with the oysters, is another glass that has fallen down, but this glass is broken. And there are pieces and shards of the broken glass all around. Hmm, wonder what message he's trying to send us. And then we notice the candle. The candle is burned down and now it's out. So one uh, one place I looked about this picture, they talked about um, Ars Longa, Vita brevis, which means art is long, life is short. And that statement, it's, even though it's in Latin, comes from the Greek, and it really has something more to do, I think, with Hippocrates and spending your life long, your life learning things. But I think that the message that we want to get out of that, and that this artist is trying to remind us of, is life is short. Life is short. The candle burns out. The glass falls over and breaks. And it's done. So this was a lovely meal. You are comfortable and well off. You have everything you need. But remember, life is short. 
So what did he put right in the center of the picture? This bread. That looks like it's been untouched. And also looks like it's about to fall off the table. And the bread clearly is a reminder to us, or at least the first thing I think of when I see it, is communion or the Eucharist. This is my body broken for you. Um, Jesus also says, um, I'm sorry? The bread of life. Yes, but it, that's exactly right, the bread of life. Um, in John 6, Jesus says, my body is the real food. So you had this great, great meal, but life is short. Remember, remember me and remember what I did for you. Now, behind, you can see a cruet, which is probably has vinegar in it, but that always, since they're right in line together, always makes me think of the bread and the wine. Um, or maybe the what vinegar just reminds you of the vinegar that Christ had on the cross right before he said it is finished. So we clearly, right in the center, have this idea that be mindful in this comfortable life you're living, that life is short, and keep Christ central to what you're doing and what you're thinking. And next to the cruet with the vinegar is a container of salt. Salt is also very, very important. Um, you know, Americans get too much salt, so we have to be careful that we're not having too much salt. But your body needs salt. Uh, salt is medicinal. Salt heals. Salt preserves. Salt makes things last. And Jesus told us that we are the salt of the earth. And so when salt loses its saltiness, it's no good anymore. So let's keep in mind that we want to be the salt of the earth. I think that that is the message that Hedda wanted people to think about. So if you had this in your dining room and you're having a lovely meal, this would really give you something to think about and maybe serve as a reminder to uh, not take too much for granted or not get too comfortable. Now, this kind of banqueting piece was a very popular kind of still life. In fact, Hedda taught his son who went on to do more of them. Um, he really is the master. But another kind of still life that was very popular with the Dutch, of course, is floral still lifes. And I think we're probably all familiar with those. And when I, I was able to visit the Netherlands for a few hours once once upon a time. <laughs> My sister was living in Belgium and we drove to the Kuchenhof to see the tulips. If you ever have the opportunity to do that, do it. It's amazing. And we went in and all day I was just like, those are the most beautiful tulips <laughs> I've ever seen. And then I would turn around and say, no, those are the most beautiful tulips I've ever seen. They were incredible. There were there were some that I remember were as tall as my brother-in-law's waist. They were just amazing. But tulips aren't native to the to Netherlands. They come from Turkey. So once again, the Dutch have imported these exotic things and uh, put them into their um, into their lives in a big way because they still they we still think of tulips when we think of um, Holland or the Netherlands today, and they still sell them. Um, and even just driving at that time of year, you see fields and fields and fields of tulips growing in roads. It's just amazing. So obviously we have to have tulips in here. Now, I don't know this from counting, but my research tells me that there are 31 types of flowers and plants in this picture. Mm -hmm. And this picture would never, ever be able to be, to exist like this because he's included different plants that bloom at different times of year. So he has used his imagination to put together this amazing arrangement of flowers. Um, and it just is one of my favorites. I just love it. But if we look more closely, we can see that this artist has a message for us to think about too. So if we go down to the corner, we will notice that, oh, there's a snail. There are a lot of creatures in this painting. There's a bumblebee, there's a ton of ants. There's some ants in this painting too, in this part. We see a snail crawling along. There are ants that are crawling along those peas, which have definitely 
are on the downhill side. Nobody's going to want to eat those peas, but the ants. Um, the flower is also fading. There's a little lizardy creature, little salamander kind of guy over here. And he has his eye on this spider that's coming down from a web. And the spider is probably looking for something to eat. And I think the salamander has found his dinner. So this little corner of the painting is talking about decay and death. There's a darkness about it. There's literally a darkness about it. He's painted it. It's, it gets very dark as we go over into the corner. So as beautiful as the whole work looks, if we really focus over here, we're like, oh, that flower. Don't you hate it when the flowers start to do that? When the live flowers, they start to look like that. But then oh, you have to throw them out. Then they start to smell bad. Then you know you have to throw them out. Well, that's what's going on in this corner of this painting. But if we look at the top of the painting, in the center, we see this beautiful flower. And we see climbing up, besides the ant that's also on it, a caterpillar inching his way up the stem. Now, I showed this picture. I, I get to help with chapel at Christ Episcopal, and I showed this picture around Easter to the children. Well, they love to tell you the whole story of caterpillars and mm -hmm. metamorphosis, <laughs> and they're very proud that they know the word metamorphosis. And we talked about the fact that caterpillars eat and eat and eat like the very hungry caterpillar. And then they spin a cocoon or a chrysalis and they go inside and they emerge as a whole new creation. And the artist has reminded us of that too. There are three butterflies in this picture. And this one is on the same flower of the stem that the caterpillar is crawling up. And this one is on the opposite side of the dead corner that we just looked at. Butterflies are a symbol of the resurrection. Uh, there are many Christian organizations and churches who have used this. The Moravians use this very often. It would use this symbol and you will see it. Um, uh, in stained glass, sometimes you will see butterflies. Uh, because it's the symbol of going into that chrysalis and you and the caterpillar in a way sort of dies. And when it comes out, it doesn't look anything like a caterpillar. It is something new. And it represents new life. So clearly, the artist has that idea for us in this picture. Then if we look more closely, we'll notice there aren't just flowers in this picture. There's wheat in this picture. And we see it several places. Um, down by the butterfly, behind the flower with the caterpillar, and on both sides. He's been very balanced. He's put the wheat all of those different places. And once again, of course, wheat is going to make us think of bread. But also um, this passage um, from John 12. Jesus says, <clears throat> unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain of wheat. But if it dies, it will bring to a, a good harvest. So in case we have missed the message somewhere, in case we haven't connected the dots well enough, we're gonna have one more clue. And again, just amazing that this artist can paint these different textures, because if you'll notice here how he's painted the glass vase that the flowers are in, um, he's given us another clue on the opposite side of the vase. If you look very closely, you will see that the window in the room has been reflected in the glass. And the window clearly makes it look like it's a cross. So right in the middle of the picture is the cross of Christ, making us remember. Some of these pictures are called um, memento more, or that expression is used um, to describe this kind of a picture. Um, <coughs> and it has another happy mem uh, message. Remember that you will die. <laughs> and I think that's what this artist has in mind. He's clearly put that sign of darkness and death into the picture. Remember that you will die. You look all oh, beautiful. You know, we, we talk about that when the cherry blossoms bloom, right? 
Washingtonians love when that happens. And we had cherry trees all over, and they're always so wonderful. It's just one of my favorite times of year. And you just love them, but they're here for such a short time. And you know, the Japanese take off, school take off work and go walk under the cherry blossoms when they're in bloom and meditate on this idea that life is short. You're, you bloom and you blossom and things are beautiful, but then it's fleeting and it doesn't last. Um, so all of these flowers are reminding us of that too. Now, these paintings, just one reason I love them so much, well, and, and many other paintings as well, Every time I, I look at them and really focus on them, I, I learn something else where I see something else. And I've talked about this painting for years. <clears throat> but just recently, when I was looking at this painting again, I was like, oh, you know what? It looks like a violet right there next to that window. So this artist has been very careful in the composition of where he placed them. And you might be aware that flowers have a lot of symbolism in themselves too. So a violet can signify a lot of things. It can signify humility because it grows low to the ground. So we often see that in religious paintings too, reminding us that Christ humbled himself to leave heaven, be born as a human baby, and then humbled himself to die on a cross for us. A violet also signifies innocence. Christ was completely innocent. Uh, 2 Corinthians reminds us um, <clears throat> oh, was that the name? No, yes, 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake he was made to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And violets can also signify faith. So I think it's a powerful reminder that by faith, you were saved through grace, not of yourself. So the work Christ did on the cross offers new life. And the whole picture together tells us that in a very balanced way, really, because he's put the cross and this piece of wheat and the caterpillar and the butterfly and the wheat is, again, right in the center. He's balanced the dead things over here with this butterfly and this healthy looking flower over here. And just given us this beautiful picture of remembering to be centered in Christ. So you could hang this in your living room mm -hmm. and it could remind you as you walk through of some things that you should use every day in your life. This is a genre scene. Yes. I have a question, the last one. Do you have um, any insight? If you, you go back, actually, sorry. Mm -hmm. So the white flower you mentioned at the top center and the bottom right there is a little bit of a red um, carnation or something. I find it peculiar that we're seeing the back side of the flower. Is mm. there anything to that? That's a very good question. I'm not sure I have an answer. I mean, he obviously did a lot of effort to construct this and taking flowers from different seasons. So. Right. Yeah. I, and I would say in one, at least for the for the white one at the top, maybe because that's where he wanted to put the caterpillar, you can see it better because you see the stem that way. Sure, um, yeah. But I think that maybe there could also be significance in the fact that he's chosen red and white mm. to be the colors of those two flowers also. Mm. Um, the blood of Christ and then... Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm sorry, I'd have to do a little more research. No, that's I mean, a good question. <laughs> um, this is a genre scene and it's called the bedroom. But that's kind of a misnomer. This is really kind of like the multi-purpose room. So uh, obviously you can see the little alcove where the bed is. Um, and uh, I'm assuming this is morning and mom is uh, folding up the blankets or airing out the linens. But probably this is also where you eat, where you have guests. Um, uh, this is by Peter de Hoek. And he was a contemporary of Vermeer's. <laughs> They're painting the same time. And he's a master of this genre type of painting. So this is really um, the ideal Dutch home. This woman just looks like an immaculate housekeeper. You think you'd probably eat off her floor. And if we look a little bit more closely at this picture, we can see something. Um, we have a light source over here on this wall with a window and a picture or a mirror on the wall. 
that if you're familiar with Vermeer should remind you of Vermeer. We have the furniture and the, the pottery and all on the wall are delft tiles. And um, the delft tiles, it's very hard to see, but they're all scenes of um, children game, children's games and children playing games. Um, we have the doors in the back that are the divided doors that we even call Dutch doors. Um, and then we have, they have a, a still life uh, or a landscape picture above the door in their home. So they're one of those families that can afford to buy the art that the artists are painting because they're not painting for the churches anymore. And then there's the chamber pot. This is always a fun picture to show to children because, you know, they don't know what a chamber pot is and then they're grossed out when they find out. What it is. <laughs> so this is life in this, this ideal Dutch home. And then we have these two figures, the mother and the child. Is it a boy? Is it a girl? It could be either because uh, boys were dressed in skirts when they were young and there was no set age for putting them in pants, which of course you can understand until you're toilet trained, it's easier to be in a skirt than in pants. So that used to um, kind of freak the children out too. The boys didn't like the idea of wearing dresses and looking like that. But the child has this delightful look on his or her face and a ball in his or her hand and is coming in and I just love this look that the mother and the child are sharing. There's just an intimacy and a warmth and a, a warm feeling in this family and in this picture while she's working. Is the child asking, can I go out? Or has the child just come out and coming in to check and see what mom is doing? It's just a really sweet atmosphere and feeling. Um, and then we can look again at the whole picture and see that this seems appears to be a loving, happy home. But if we look more closely, we see right in the center is a closet. Yeah. Now, I talked about this picture many, many times on many, many school tours. And I like the picture, and I enjoy talking about the picture. But then one day, a lecturer at the gallery was talking about this picture and said, have you noticed the cross in the middle of the painting? And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> How did I miss that? And then once you know it's there, you can't not see it. And the minute you start to look at it, that's what you notice right away. So the center of this home is the cross of Christ. At the, Christ, the cross of Christ, which is foolishness to the world, but salvation to those who believe. Uh, now, the cross is not always a happy symbol. Obviously, crucifixion was the worst way to die. That's why the Romans used it. And if you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified because it was the worst way to die. It was a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and I remember a pastor at my church when I was growing up saying, you know, people wear crosses around their necks. Um, if it was, because when, when I was growing up in the 60s, um, he said, if we were going to talk about capital punishment today, you'd be wearing little electric chairs on a chain. Because that was, crucifixion was the capital punishment of its day. And it was an awful way to die. Um, John Stott, who was the pastor for many, many years at All Souls in London, uh, wrote a book called The Cross of Christ. And he wrote in that, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? So it's, I think, fine to think like, oh, it's a happy home and everybody's happy in this home because Christ and the cross are the center of the home. But we need to understand that there's more to that. We need to understand what the cross represents and the fact that Christ died for us. Um, and he wants us now to live. Um, to love others. He loved us so much that he was willing to do that. And now you go love in turn. And to me, this looks like a very loving relationship and a family that is not only centering their life, parents who have chosen to center their life around Christ, but who are choosing to raise their children that way also. 
uh, because this is something that you need to teach and you need to teach each generation. So the last picture I have for you is the master, Vermeer, um, who is favorite of many, many people. You know, it's, it's been a while, but a number of years ago, there's a, a Vermeer exhibit here in Washington and the lines were long. People stood in line for hours to go through that exhibit. Maybe some of you did. It was a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> exhibit um, with many, many of his paintings. And happily for us, the National Gallery has several of them. Um, and they're near and dear to people. This is a very small painting. None of these pictures are huge. The banqueting piece is probably the biggest, but this is a small painting. And um, when you're a docent at the gallery, at least when I was, they, you were told you needed to come early to the gallery and walk your tour before you gave it because paintings move and things move. So you needed to be sure that things were where they were supposed to be when you got there. So I was in the room that, where this painting usually hung one day and a guard came up to me and said, he opened his wallet and he took out a picture of this painting and said, do you know what's happened to this painting? And I said, oh, I think it's been, it's on loan in New York for an exhibit. It'll be back soon. And I walked away and I thought, wow, he lives with that painting and he, it means so much to him that he carries a picture of it in his wallet. That's kind of cool. So what's going on in this picture? This is called Woman Holding a Balance. So remember when we said in the bedroom there was a window on the side and a picture or a mirror hang on the wall? Same thing. But the other picture had light coming in from another direction also. This is the only light source Vermeer has given us or that we can recognize in this painting. And this is probably a mirror because of the table where she is standing. And there's this yellow curtain over it that's giving a certain glow to the light. And then on the table, um, I'm kind of reminded of the banqueting piece again, because there's another beautiful piece of cloth. This time it's blue. And Vermeer has, of course, done it in an amazing way. And her jewel box is open with her jewelry. So we see pearls, maybe some gold. Um, I can't even begin to imagine how small the brush was that Vermeer used to paint these pearls because the painting is small, the pearls are tiny, and he's got the luster of the pearls. It just looks so realistic. He was just so amazing and so gifted. Even the way he paints the wall behind it, it's a blank wall, probably white, but looks dark because of the lighting effect, but the grays and the shadows and the, it just amazes me how he was able to do that. And then the figure in the painting, of course, is this woman. And she's very fashionably dressed. So she, and she has a jewelry box full of pearls. So clearly she is also a woman uh, who lives comfortably in this wealthy country. Um, a lot of people think that she's pregnant. I don't really think that she is. I just think that's the style um, of, the, of the day and the way the clothes are designed to fit. I don't know that it matters, but what I think is more important is her face and this little, we've just caught her in this kind of intimate moment of contemplation. And in her hand, as the title tells us, she's holding a balance. Well, what is a balance? Um, a balance is a scale. And what would she be doing with it? Well, measuring her jewels to see what they're worth, uh, putting, um, something, piece of gold on one side and measuring it with weights on the other to see how much gold she has. Um, but we don't actually see her doing that. And remember, there's a mirror right in front of her, but she's not looking in the mirror, which is often a symbol of vanity. Um, so she's not interested in how she looks outwardly. She's not interested in adorning herself. She's not trying on the, the necklace. Um, or doing anything like that. She's very, very focused on the scale and the equilibrium that we seem to have. There's nothing on the scale, on the little pans. So we, we've reached this point of, of equilibrium and we wonder what she's thinking. What is she thinking about 
weighing or measuring. But Vermeer's given us great big clue because the painting behind her is the Last Judgment. And if you see carefully, you can see Christ in the center up above. And uh, Jesus said in John 5, the Father has put judgment entirely into the Son's hands. So we know that Jesus is going to come again to judge. And if we go to Revelation, we read, And then I saw a great white throne and one seated upon it, from whose presence both earth and sky fled and vanished. Then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the book concerning what they had done. The sea gave up its dead, and the death and the grave gave up its dead, which were in them, and then were judged each according to what he had done. So clearly, in the Last Judgment, we see that Christ is preparing to judge, and we see all the bodies right behind her head on either side. Is her name in the Book of Life? She certainly doesn't seem concerned. She seems calm. She seems pensive. And the message here is really, how do we balance earthly treasures with eternal consequences. And it's kind of what we've seen all along in all of the paintings. How do we balance earthly treasures with eternal consequences? Um, there's a judgment also in weighing our choices and what we choose to do. And are we doing that in anticipation of the life to come? How are we living our life today? But this woman does not seem concerned. She looks to me to feel secure in the knowledge that her, her name is in the book of life. She seems to be a woman of, who is mindful that you need to have that balance um, in this moment of contemplation. She seems to have an inner peace. So let me just go real quick to Hebrews. Yeah, it's the right reference. No, the fact is that now, at this point in time, the end of the present age, he has appeared once and for all to abolish sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as surely as it is appointed for all men to die once, and after that pass to their judgment, so it is certain that Christ is offered once to bear the sins of many, and after that, to those who look for him, he will appear a second time, not this time to deal with sin, but to bring to full salvation those who eagerly await. So I think that this woman is eagerly awaiting the day that she will see her Lord. Now, light has played an important part in all of these pictures, and Vermeer is often called the, the artist or the master of light because he was uh, did such an amazing job of it. So that just, of course, once again, makes me think of Christ being the light of the world, and that in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, so... It is meaningful to me, and I love that these artists lived hundreds of years ago. But they have a message that I can relate to today. And they were reading the same scripture that I'm reading, and they were understanding the same things that I understand to be the basis of my faith. And I love the fact that Christ and is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That this is uh, a story, and these are images that are going to be um, of significance and importance long after I'm gone, long after the artists who painted them are gone. Uh, but it does sadden me that in a secular 
time in the era that we have reached. Uh, many people don't see it that way. And uh, even if you go to look at um, descriptions of some of these paintings, um, they will make some me mention of, and the artist uses symbols like the butterfly, which means resurrection. That's, that's it. Because that, that's what the artist did. But the commentator today is not necessarily going to dig deep into that, either because they don't believe or they don't even think their audience is going to understand if they try to explain it. Um, I had a, a Christmas story one time, a tour with small children, and we were going to see a picture of uh, the adoration of the Magi. And I said something like, and now we're going to go see a, a picture from the Christmas story. And this little girl said, Bella's, Bella's Enchanted Christmas Story? Like, no, the original Christmas story. Uh, but I would be really stunned to find out that children had no idea what this image was. Um, one time a child said to me, why is that old man kneeling and kissing that baby's foot? They had no idea who the baby was. They had no idea who the Magi were. Um, this is just... Um, something that in many cases is not being taught. So um, I love to take my students to the National Gallery of Art. And when I was an art teacher, I did that a lot. Um, and even today in my classroom, I like to use art to illustrate things that we're learning. Um, because for one thing, I want, well, there's several reasons why I did it. First of all, I wanted my students to feel comfortable in the art gallery. <laughs> I wanted my students to feel like this place is for me. And this is a place where I feel comfortable. And this is a place that I like to come. And I want to go back there and to go visit old friends. But I also want them to be careful in looking. And I just want to encourage you to be careful in looking if you go to look at art. Um, there's a lot to see. And, you know, you could argue, well, modern art, maybe not so much, but, you know, you might be surprised. We can have that conversation, too. Um, sometimes uh, we do an exercise that's, um, I see, I think, I wonder. Um, my uh, seventh graders are just starting World War II, and so we just looked at Picasso's picture of Guernica the other day, a reproduction of it. Couldn't take them to think, see the real thing. Uh, and the first thing is just, what do you see? Don't tell me what you think is happening. Just tell me what you see. Just put, and, and put the obvious things. What colors do you see? What objects do you recognize? Do you see figures? And they make a list of the things they see and talk about that. Now, what do you think is happening? Um, sometimes I'll have them look and then I'll say, okay, now go back and look again. Or write down five things you see. Okay, now go back and write five more things that you see. <laughs> and this is a good kind of an exercise for all of us just to uh, really look carefully. Um, like I say, I see things in these pictures that I've looked at that I think I know that picture. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> just realized something about that picture. Um, and then what do you wonder? Who would you ask the artist if you could? Why do you think the artist did that? Um, and I just think that uh, it offers uh, a moment for us to stop and think. And again, it worries me that we are raising a generation of children who don't necessarily take the time to do that all the time. They have short attention spans and they want things to move fast. And I want to slow them down and ask them, please think, take a minute to think. And don't check what somebody else thinks. Just first tell me what you think. Use your eyes to give you information and see if you can come to a conclusion. So I hope that you have enjoyed some of the conclusions that I've come to today, looking at these four Dutch paintings um, by artists that I love and um, sharing a way that I think they were using secular images to give sacred messages or using everyday items that we are around all the time to remind us of things that should be important to our faith and that are eternal. And um, as some of you who read the book, uh, I just only just started reading it, I think also, um, you know, God uses cracked pots. None of us are perfect. None of us do everything exactly the way we're supposed to. 
And these artists did not necessarily live exemplary lives. And some of them had very sad lives. Um, these artists are, are amazingly gifted people. God has given them a tremendous talent. But Vermeer couldn't live off what he was making, selling his paintings. There was a glut of art on the Dutch market. Artists could not live by selling their paintings. Today, they're worth thousands and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But then he died almost penniless. Um, but they still, God still used them in a powerful way and is still using them today. <laughs> So, um, okay, if I close in prayer, would you please pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for this time. I just so appreciate being able to share something that um, I enjoy doing with these new friends. And we are so thankful, Lord, for the gifts you give all of us and that you, the creator, have made us in your image and you want us to create. Thank you for these creations by these four artists. Thank you for the way they use their talents to help us be pointed to you. And please help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on the cross. Please help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on Christ. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you died for us. We thank you that you offer us eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all very much. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> yes, one over here. Uh -huh. I don't know if I can answer them, but I will try. Did any of the artists write their own exposition of their paintings, or is all the interpretation done by third parties? That's a really good question. No, I don't think any of them wrote um, anything about them. Um, and uh, a lot of them are written, you know, I did research and read what other art historians had said about them. I don't always agree, but sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, I noticed that. Or going back just to be sure, like um, like there are 31 different kinds of flowers in that picture. I wouldn't know that on, on my own. So they've done that kind of research, but I think that the people at the time and the artists might have just assumed that people were gonna know like, these flowers don't all bloom at the same time. This wouldn't be a real thing. Um, but it makes it more universal and it makes it for all seasons. Um, but I, it, I'm not aware that they wrote anything. I think they just let their art speak for itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, first of all, it's just thank you so much for your presentation. It was very eye opening. Okay. And, and your relationship to uh, the Bible and to our faith. <laughs> I have two impressions. One is, first of all, the quality of this art. Uh, it almost looks like a photo <laughs> of real life. Secondly, you have you have this kind of surface, at least for me, an appreciation for the depth, unique depth. That we just said the word talent, but unique depth that these artists have had. So I have really, to be honest with you, uh, quite focused on the fact that in two dimensions. One is the dimension of the scenes that they're trying to paint. Um, just the shading, the light, the the observability that they have of just life and surroundings and landscapes and things is just unbelievable. It's not two dimensions; it's multidimensional. And how you how you do something like that, I have no idea. So that's one level of genius. But the other aspect that you introduced, which I thought was quite powerful, is they also seem to have a purpose that they're trying to transmit. In the scene that they're taking, it's not just say, "Well, that's a pretty scene. Let me just paint that." No, no. They put a number of things together to transmit a message, and I haven't really, to be honest with you, until you spoke about it, thought of it that way. I mean, I'm not an art kind of super any stretch. I, I can appreciate good pictures, but from a surface point of view, and you've introduced the dimension from the standpoint of the artist that has been, at least for me, extremely revealing. Oh, good. So that's wonderful. Oh, Thank you good. for that. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, yes, their composition. They're masters of composition and um, just simple placement of things. Yeah. But um, one thing that made this uh, um, possible was oil paint. Um, you can do more with oil paint um, and just subtleties of color, but um, it takes a long time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they're just beyond gifted. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, thank you for this nice presentation. Vermeer painted what, 37 paintings? In his well, we have it. That's about what we have with Exton. Right. Yeah. They were for patrons. Well, yes. And <laughs> or he hoped somebody would buy them. <laughs> but many times the paint, he painted them for patrons and they wanted to put in the composition reflection of the patron's status, importance, etc. So sometimes like with this painting, we don't know who it was for, no. but they, the composition would be tailored to the appeal of the patron. Possibly. Um, you know, he, and some of, of Vermeer's paintings are more allegorical, um, he, and some of them have little stories behind them. You look at them and you could, you know, write a whole soap opera about some of what's going on in some of them. And they're very simple. They're all very simple compositions, very similar to this. Um, a single figure, often a woman, standing in front of a window, doing something, writing a letter, reading a letter, crying on a necklace. Um, uh, and But the idea of a patron wanting um, their status to be in a painting goes way, way back. So even when artists were painting altarpieces in churches, um, oftentimes the patron is right in there with the disciples or the people um, and are recognizable because well, in some cases, I think the patron was hoping that by spending my money to, to put this altarpiece in the church, that's going to buy my way into heaven. I might have done this, this, and this, but I paid for that altarpiece. And there I am in it. <laughs> but certainly, if you have a patron, you have to try to please them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. <laughs> It's been so fun to be with you. Oh, yeah, yes. Just one more. I think it's amazing though, that uh, the reflections we really had, uh, um, the way it was done, there wasn't much value as we value now. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder what else are we not valuing now that could be of value as well? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, just this painting had a lot to say, just like when you read the Bible today, the difference tomorrow, which is the meaning. And I just think it's amazing how you just. Well, I think the artists did that, and I just got to share with you what I thought they were saying. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to say I couldn't see it close up, but in the painting of the big um, floral bouquet, mm -hmm. from far away, I really couldn't see, but I began to imagine that there were grape leaves there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it would make sense because of the wheat. Well, there there are vegetables and leaves, right? And I think that that's a fair interpretation. And so the wine and bread, um, um, that that was one interpretation that I had. And then, are you sure it's thirty one and not thirty three? That would be too perfect. <laughs> thirty three for Jesus as well. Um, and then, I, just as a personal note, I just thought it was funny. That in the next painting, that the where you said the cross mm -hmm. was in, that was the first thing I saw. Oh, good for you. Oh, no. <laughs> and then I was so satisfied that I kept looking for more. Okay, crosses. how many people saw the cross first thing? <laughs> Two of you. Good for you. Yeah. It, but it, it, so it, it was a problem. I can't tell you how many times I looked at that picture without seeing that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yes, once you see it, that's yeah. all you see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, once you see that's just like, well, it's a painting of a cross. <laughs> so, yeah. so Adam, you mentioned about being able to see the painting well. So as you're talking, I was Googling. And so all these paintings have been digitized by the National Gallery. Okay, yeah. And so you can download a high resolution. Oh, absolutely. Literally have it open right now, and right? you can zoom <laughs> in. It, yes, yes. I might have said this before you came in. Oh, okay, then, so yeah. you can see the pictures. Actually, you can see some parts of the pictures better doing I, that. I do that yeah. than you can standing in front of the actual picture. Because yeah, you can make it in. bigger. And yeah. really look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you all go home and do that. Another <laughs> thing is that the first thing I saw on this that bouquet, where the um, in the lower left, that the portion of the picture that you started your your presentation mm -hmm. with, it looks like a cross from far away. Oh, okay. You see? Yes. Oh, with the keys and the the keys. To me, it looks like a uh -huh. flying cross. Uh huh. But mm -hmm. I can't see too well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you look closely, we've got a nice, healthy pea pod and a really not so good pea pod. <laughs> I think Susan. I have a question online. 
Hey, what? Susan, what can we do for you? Susan, I've got a question. Are, are, are all four of these pictures at the National Gallery or are any of them in Amsterdam? Uh, they are all at the National Gallery of Art and you can find them all online. Thank you. And or go visit them. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Where are you in North Carolina? Um, between Charlotte and Greensboro. Very nice. He already said that it was 80 degrees there and very good. <laughs> yes. So a closing question, how will artificial intelligence affect the great artists? Well, I hope it won't affect the great artists. It's definitely going to affect things that are going to be produced from now on. Um, it might be interesting to put, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm, 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 our artificial intelligence scares me, and as a teacher, just really, really makes me have the heebie-jeebies. Um, I one thing I think it's going to do in some cases is make teachers be old school again. I know some college professors now are giving, uh, once again, giving essay tests in the classroom with paper and pencil because they can't trust their students to I, be online doing anything. I do oral exams for my students. <laughs> oh, yeah! Wow. <laughs> That's time consuming, but that would be- They powerful. got five minutes to present. So anyway, yeah. What grade do you teach? This was a college class. Mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah, no, artificial intelligence is scary. <laughs> and how do you teach artificial intelligence ethics? Well, the question is, gonna be, someone's gonna say, paint me a picture that looks like Vermeer that has a woman on the right and paint, you know, this on the left and the style of this and includes a cross. I might have, the computer's going to like do yeah. it. They just oh, do it by paper. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It takes all the fun out of it. It takes a lot of fun. The thing, though, to this point on the artificial intelligence, but I have some familiarity with it. It's basically algorithms and decision trees mm -hmm. that are programmed by people yeah. that have access to thousands, if not millions of pieces of information in every encyclopedia and so on. And so it's sort of an if then, okay, if this situation is here, that creates this situation. It's not really um, intelligence in terms of human intelligence right. Right, right. that can be, you know, very creative uh, or uh, I'm, I'm searching for the right words, but it, it doesn't think like humans think. Mm -hmm. it, they're as spontaneous as humans are. It's all based upon what is a, a storehouse <laughs> of information. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's sort of if then this let me present it with this situation. Well, we've studied, and there are these other situations that would result. Therefore, this is what's going to happen. Right. And it's very powerful in that context. So, like for for medical things and stuff like that. But it doesn't replace human no. No, no ingenuity. But I, I heard of a student yeah. recently. Somebody told me this anecdote that the student used artificial intelligence to write a paper. Yeah. Then put it in a different language, and then had it translated back to English, and then did that again. Uh, he did all of the things he thought he could do, so that the percentages went down that the professor would know that he had used artificial intelligence. Yeah. If he had used all that energy and time, yeah. <laughs> to just write the paper himself. Well, it, it does use resources. No, of course, yeah. the resources um. We're just in, thinking about the ethical side. Sometimes they're sexist, racist. I mean, who knows what? You know, anti-Semitic. I mean, there's all Absolutely. kinds of. And I suspect there'll be more and more deliberate misinformation put in. Just the leaders are quite a lot of hit. But the research group I'm with is using artificial intelligence for years to analyze some genomic data, and it's very powerful for that. Of course. Uh, and photography and then I have several programs that for years have used it for refining pictures and. You know, sharpening the focus, and it's, it's sometimes it does a very good job of that, and sometimes it's just totally wrrong. So it's the uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of very ethical questions just from yes. you know religious side and um, yeah. um, all sorts of. Yeah. I think we have Diane. Do you have a question? Well, I was just going to add to the discussion on AI. We're definitely dealing with it in the colleges and universities already. Uh, it's pretty easy to de detect in my uh, experience. Um, and we are also using programs that identify, you come out of uh, PTT with, with a report that says, 
60% is developed through artificial intelligence. But you realize it's going to be added to Microsoft Office in the next edition. It's going to be added to Grammarly, some of the uh, programs we're using. And we're already seeing student essays this way. Uh, but it's getting better all the time, folks. Um, I don't think it's always going to be so easy to detect. So we're already taking steps, for example, as of right now, artificial intelligence cannot get through a paywall. So therefore, if you tell the student they must use the academic library at the college, it's pretty hard for them to use AI. Um, another thing that I employ is I give them eight essays, either that are on the, in their textbook or that I've provided on a particular subject and tell them they have to use those eight essays. They can't use artificial intelligence, cannot work with that. So there are things we can do, but we also see it getting better all the time. And it's probably only a matter of time till we're going to have to have them have make an honor code statement that they haven't used it in the writing classes. Yeah, we yeah. have an honor code in my school and sometimes yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you had a question. Uh, yes, uh, regarding artificial intelligence, uh, they have something called big data. So they take all the information and they come up with whatever that they want to find out. Uh, one of the problems is that they also use the great literature and great, great literature are not evidence-based. So they are not reviewed by them. So these are the information that they are out there. And it is also included in these artificial intelligence. So anything which is not evidence-based, it can cause problems when you come up with a conclusion based on that. Well, I didn't know how many people would be here, but when I was getting ready for this talk today, I found out I used to do a project years ago when I taught art about uh, this painting. And um, the children would make a book and they would put the picture in it so they would have a souvenir of, of having gone to the gallery. Um, I don't even think they do this anymore because they don't sell very many postcards at the gallery anymore. They don't do them. Yeah. But I have, they're all of the woman with the balance. So if you would like to take one home as a souvenir, <laughs> please help yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.